did because while the next parak maybe seems to begin with a new topic, not exactly the structure of the sukkah, but how one sort of uh, ways in which one can sit in a sukkah with not being yotze, as we'll see, it soon is going to return to issues of the structure of the sukkah. So not exactly clear what distinguishes the second parak from the first, um, and most of the second parak is going to continue to be devoted to issues around the structure of the sukkah, although towards the end we will introduce the question of the mitzvah of, or the issue of the mitzvah of sitting in the sukkah. Let's start now with the Mishnah at the in the bottom third of Chafamat Bet. Hayashin Tachas Hamita Besukah. Somebody sleeps under again. Interesting to note that when it wants to talk about whether you're Yotze or not, the classic uh, this, uh, activity that the Mishnayis address is sleeping. For us, we were talking about can you eat in the sukkah? Um, obviously, you have to both sleep and eat, but as we're going to find out later, te- it's sort of like um, non, um, what the Gemara Squad says is like temporary, ad hoc eating, you can do outside of a sukkah. You know, you eat a fruit or whatever, you're not sitting down for a meal. Whereas, even a brief nap has to be done in a sukkah. So sleeping, we can talk about later why we don't sleep in a sukkah, but sleeping, as far as the mission is concerned, is the primary activity. All sleeping is done in a sukkah. And therefore, that's the reason it uses it to discuss, you know, um, what, even if you have a kosher sukkah, um, are you yotze when you eat in it, in a, or I see I just said that, when you sleep in it in a certain way. So for example, earlier we discussed if you have four tfachim of pasuschach, based on where those tfachin are, the sukkah could be kosher, but ain't yashenim tahta. You don't sleep under it, which means you don't eat or sleep. But again, that's the verb it uses. Take a look at the rash, first Rashi here. It's Hayashen Tachlemita Lo Yatsa, says Rashi, De'oa Mavsik Be'no Lo Sukkah. If you're sleeping under the bed in the sukkah, you don't fulfill because the top of the bed is like a separate tent, roofing, and it separates you and the schach of the sukkah. The Ikhi Yeshiva Sukkah, Achila Shkia Vashina. Okay, those three activities, eating, drinking, and sleeping, and as I said, sleeping more than, more than everything. So back to the Mishnah. If you sleep underneath a bed in a sukkah, so the bed is now a separate roofing between you and the schach, so you didn't fulfill your obligation. You're under the roof of the bed and not the roof of the schach. I'm a Rebbe Yehuda, said Rebbe Yehuda, You know, it's not true. We would sleep under the, the, the bed in a sukkah, and they never said anything to us. They never complained to us. Again, quite fascinating. You might remember going back to the beginning of the first parak, stories about, oh, you know, the elders, they came to visit, visit Hilni Hamalka, and, you know, and, and they went a tall sukkah, and nobody said anything. That was, again, Rebbe Yehuda, right? Remember Rebbe Yehuda, who said a very tall sukkah is good, right? And then he said, oh, wasn't there a story where the elders came and visit, visited Hilni Hamalka, then there's a whole story about Hill of Shammai. Wasn't there the case where you know they went and they visited this uh, rabbi and he was his his table was inside the house and he was eating in the sukkah? So it's quite fascinating in some sectors how much you know they're bringing like case evidence. You know they're actually bringing Misa shahaya you know stories to prove what the halacha is. Um, so you see that quite a bit here in the in this mesecha. So Rabbi Yudah says, look. We would sleep under the sukkah in front of the elders, and nobody ever said, oh, you're doing the wrong thing. I'm a Rebbe Shimon. So I said, Rebbe Shimon. So he's going to have a counter story to Rebbe Huda. No, there was a story with Tevi, the servant of Rebbe Um And, you know, um, and who, who more is the Zakanim than remember Gamliel, the Nasi? Tepi was sleeping underneath the bed. The Armelan Rebbe Gamliel was a Zakanim, and Rebbe Gamliel said to the elders, those same elders that you said that you, that you wanted to infer from their silence that they were okay with sleeping under the under the bed. Rebbe Gamliel said to these elders, the Isim Tevi Avdi Shehu Tamid Chacham. Guys, do you see Tevi, my servant? He's such a Torah scholar. And he knows that slaves are exempt. Therefore, he's, and that's why he's sleeping under, under the bed. So it was quite clear, whatever the elders felt, maybe the elders didn't respond either way, you know? But whatever the elders felt, it's clear that Rebbe Leo was clear to him that you can't sleep under a, can't sleep under a bed in a sukkah. Says the Mishnah, or maybe says Rebbe Shimon, you know, by inf- you know, and so of like, um, um, and therefore, what's a good uh, idiom of Lufi Darchenu um, as an aside, or like sort of along the way? Actually, along the way, <laughs> along the way, you can you can you can see you can infer. So that sitting under the sukkah does not fulfill. So you, Rebbe Yehuda, you want to bring us a proof from the silence of the uh, elders, from the silence of the Zakanim. I'm going to tell you a story with Rebbe Gamliel and the Zakanim. It's quite clear that you cannot sleep under a bed in a sukkah. Now, by the way, um, 
very fascinating little Tosos here. If you look at this little Tosos, he says, Evid Kosher Haya. He was obviously a very um, kosher, meaning not just, not, tech, not just kosher, like a, a righteous slave, um, you know, observant and uh, careful and knowledgeable. And the Yushalmi, it says he would even put on tefillin. And the rabbis did not object. That's actually quite part of that whole discussion about women in tefillin. Um, so the Yushalmi says that Tevi would do it as well. And they didn't object. is reversing himself. Here, it seems like they're forcing him to be under the bed. They're not letting him sit in a sukkah like a, in order to be yod, say, the mitzvah. And how come by the tefillin they didn't object, right? And as we know nowadays, people more object by tefillin than they object by other yeah. things. So how come the sages did the opposite? They didn't object him wearing tefillin, but they, you know, maybe objected to him sitting in a sukkah because they forced him under the bed. <laughs> no, 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 no. They would have been fine with him sitting in the sukkah, except you ran out of room. There wasn't enough room for the people that were obligated. So he agreed to sleep under a bed. Otherwise, he would have slept in the sukkah like anybody else. Um, so, so then why isn't he just leaving the sukkah? So, Mishani, because he wanted to be part of the Torah discussions. <laughs> so he really was an Ebed Kosher. He wasn't just an Ebed Kosher that he knew that he was exempt. He was an Ebed Kosher that if there wasn't enough room, rather than going inside, he'd rather be under the bed, eavesdropping on the Chachamim than going inside. Yes. Right. Lidchok here means that they were squeezed for room. Yeah, it's literal. It's not. It's not. Yeah. Meta it's not right. It's not yeah. metaphoric. Okay, right. Second of all, could you say anything more? We see so much about Shabi and my friend. That's what Yeah. He was in. Evid Ivri in Denji. No, Evid Kanani. He was an Evid Kanani. Yeah, that's why he's part of Mina Sukkah. If he was an Evid right. Ivri, he'd be Chayv okay. in Sukkah. And, and do you know anything else about that? Not only did he convert did he like ever use no, did, did they ever free him the, um there's a gemara in um in um what do you call it in Baba Kama. Ever, all Ebed, well if he ever gets freed right i mean the gemara in brachos makes it clear that he died he was still in evid because it has the whole discussion of whether you're yeah. right when he died so it seems okay. very clear that he died okay. even as an evid yeah Okay, so the Gemara says like this. So that's the in the debate about whether you can sleep under a bed in a sukkah. So the Gemara says, "Vahalek asara." Why should it be a problem being under a bed? There's not ten fachim from the floor to the bottom of the bed, and presumably you need ten fachim for it to be considered a separate ohel. So Targum Shmuel b'mita asara. No, it says, "Okay, we're talking that it is ten, and that's the case." Now Tosos points out, if you look again at the first Tosos in in the parak, Hayashen, the one before the one we did, Tachzimita b'sukkah lo yata, b'gemara muki la Shmuel b'gavo asara, the pach mikam lo chashivo la hafsi. Matzina lemeimer. This is not the first time Tosos is doing this. The Shmuel letaime, the master parak kama tachtona k'shem bel yonasara. Remember the question about sukkah tachas asukkah, how separate the top stach had to be to define it as two schachs. <laughs> And Shmuel was the one who said ten tefachim. So Tosa is saying, "Ah, oh, look! It looks like Shmuel is being consistent. You know, he understands that less than ten tefachim isn't a separate schach for two kosher schachs to make into the tukatach the sukkah. So he won't consider by a pasul schach anything less than ten tefachim is not a problem to be considered a distinct roof to be a problem. Now, of course, you could be more strict. You could say when you're dealing with all kosher schach to create this strange problem of sukkatach the sukkah, you need ten tefachim. You need the amount that would make it a kosher sukkah. If you're dealing with a pasul like a bed, anything maybe that's a tefach or four tefachim is enough to create a problem in saying you're under a different schach. Okay, you could have been more strict, but Shmuel at least is consistent and in both cases does not see a problem until it's ten tefachim. Tosos in a number of places wants to test that issue about, you know, the different positions there, ten tefachim, four tefachim, one tefach, how does that play out in analogous cases of other questions about a separate tent, a separate roof, and so on. All right, now the Gemara is going to introduce, in order to understand Rebbe Yehuda, why is it that Rebbe Yehuda does not have a problem with a bed and a sukkah, introduce a whole discussion about oalos, right, because that's the other, you know, area that's interesting. It's so, again, fascinating how much of <coughs> aros is intersex our mesechet. On the one hand, schach can't be from something that's makabal tuma, so we have to have major discussions about what types of things are vessels and can be makabal tuma. And the other thing is, is that schach is a type of a roof and an ohel. Well, the other major discussion we have about ohel is in mesechet's oalos, about what type of a roof transports tumah, you know, carries the tumah of mace, corpse impurity. So we're going to, in order to understand why Rebuta doesn't have a problem with 
a bed, we're going to look at Reb Yudah's position by the ohel of corpses and to see maybe there's a category of things which he doesn't consider to be a real ohel, and the bed is one of them. So let's take a look at why that would be. So let's look at the Gemara. Tanan Hassan, we taught over there in Oelos. Um, if you have a, a tunnel, a hole in the ground, but whatever, going, um, you know, a tunnel in the ground that was dug out by water, right, the water formed the tunnel, or shratim, or other types of, like, rodents, um, or, like, the salt, the minerals of the ground, you know, sort of hollowed out some space, some type of a tunnel space, or let's say you have a pile of stones, um, Soa shall corrode, or a pile of beans. So, mahil alatuma, meaning in the first case is the owa was not made by human agency at all. In the second case is it was made by human agency, but it was not made intentionally to serve as an ohel. I don't just even mean an ohel mace. It wasn't made intentionally to be a roof of the space beneath it. Here you are. These are your, you know, these are your beams. Right? These are your like, you know, your not your beams of wood, and you're just putting and you're just stacking beams, right? And you just happen to be like, you know, like, you know, imagine stacking bricks, right? You just happen to be stacking it. And it happened to be that you left a little gap here. And then it happens to be that there's a corpse or a piece of a corpse between this gap. So it was made by human agency, but it wasn't made to serve as some type of a roof to the space below it. You were just stacking beams. So those are two categories that Rebbe Huda deals with, which are things that are not made at all by human agency, or they are, but they're not made at all to serve as the purpose of some type of a roof. Is the Kavana issue? Yeah. Like I mean, while the first case is even bigger than Kavana, it wasn't even made by human hands altogether. Right. The second case is a Kavana issue. And Rebbe Huda is not going to consider that an Ohel. So Rebbe Huda Omer, and that is roofing over a tuma. If it's not made by human agency, and again, it means here more than just human agency, intentionally, it is not a ohel. And you can see where the Gemara is going, because the same might be true by a bed. When you put out a bed, you don't do it to serve as a roof to the space below. It's like stacking beams. So that maybe does not constitute an ohel for it. It has to be made to serve as some type of a roof to the space below. So, first let's figure this out. My time at the Rebbe Yehuda. What's the reasoning of Rebbe Yehuda that that does not count as an Ohel? Yolif, top of Chafal of Hamad Aleph. Yolif, he, he learns out, Ohel, Ohel, mi Mishkan. Gzeva Shava from the Mishkan. Ksiv hacha zos ha-Torah adam ki amus ba-Ohel. This is the law if a man dies in a tent. Everything in the tent is Tamei. So there it uses the word Ohel. That's the major idea of Ohel for Tuma. Uh, for the tomb of, de, of of mace of corpses, the ksiv haslam, and it says by the mishkan vayifros vayifros uh, ha'ol al mishkan. He Moshe you know spread out the tent over the mishkan. Right, we just read it last week's parsha. <laughs> so malo lombi de adam. The same way there, the ol is something that is created for the purpose of a tent and made by human agency. Afkami de adam. Any ol has to be like the mishkan. It has to be made by intentionally to serve as an ohel, to serve as a type of a roof to the space below. So that's his position. Rabbanan, and the rabbis would say, oh, 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 Reba. No. If you read that parak of, of Chukas, Adam came us, oh, it says, oh, well, many, many times. Kol Sheba oh, well, kol Koba, oh, well, oh, well, oh, well, oh, well, it says it so many times. So it's coming to include all types of tents, not just ones that are like the Mishkan, even ones that are made naturally. Okay. So, Reb, yes? yes. That's why there's like 18 times. Right. 18 <laughs> exactly. What do you do with all the other OLs in the parasha? Yeah, I don't know. So, okay. And so now we've got that Reb Yehud, and that might very nicely link with our Mishnah. But first we have to test whether he can really sustain that position. Does he really hold that any roof or, you know, not made for the purpose of serving as a roof does not count for laws of Tumantara? Raminu, I'll ask you on this. They would have courtyards built in Yerushalayim, leveled out, you know, in Yerushalayim, on top of a rock. This is a Mishnah in Para. And this is, the basic story here is, as you'll remember, they had one leniency by Paraduma in order to, you know, to sort of, to, to spite or to, you know, to undermine the position of the Tzedukim. The Tzedukim, would, you know, learned that if somebody had gone to the mikvah, he could not do the, uh, you know, the sprinkling of the para, he could not burn the para, excuse me, um, unless he, unless it had become nightfall, unless he was pure, purely tahor. And the rabbis understood, even if he was a tfu yom, even if he had been to the mikvah that day, even before nightfall, 
um, he could still do, the Kohen could still do the burning of the para. And they specifically put the Kohen in that situation in order to prove that their, their, you know, their position and not the Sudukin. But once they were having that leniency and even like an intentional, you know, leniency, they then went overboard in the opposite direction to be super, super strict. So nobody should ever be, lean, you know, generally like not sufficiently careful regarding the paraduma. So they had crazy stringencies to compensate for that one area that they were intentionally lenient. So, for example, you remember we learned in Yoma, they had a whole process of, you know, sprinkling the ashes of paraduma on the Kohen who was going to do the par, you know, seven days leading up to, to it the same way they did it for the Kohen on Yom Kippur. So here we're going to see if that, you know, if you thought that was extreme, here it's going to be super extreme what they did to, in order to do the process of making the paraduma. So let's take a look. So they would build courtyards, they leveled out courtyards in Yerushalayim on top of a rock, like on top of like a, you know, an outcropping of rock, the Tachteim Chalal, and underneath the rock was an uh, open space, meaning what? That therefore it should not be, the concern was maybe somewhere buried deep in the ground is a dead body that you don't know about, and anywhere you're walking, you're going to become Tame. This type of a concern is called Tumat home the tumor of the depths. Who knows what lies in the depths, you know, and therefore, maybe anywhere you're going, you're becoming tummy mace. So the entire process leading up to the paraduma, they made sure that people were so, it was impossible to become tummy mace. So the first part is that you're going to be in a courtyard that's on an outcropping of rock, okay? So here you are, you're on an outcropping of rock, okay, and here's your courtyard, right? And here you're doing the paraduma. So if there's any tumor, right, buried down here, even if it were to go up, it would, it would stop because it's, you know, there's a gap. You're on top of an outcropping of rock. All right? It's clear? So that's the first thing you do. By the way, I made it an outcropping. It could also be that it could just be like a case where there's like a cave underneath it. Yeah. You know? And either way, though, you're on top of rock, so there's nothing buried in the rock, and there's a gap between the bottom of the rock and whatever the next sort of ground level is. So even if there's any tumor down here, you're going to be safe. Okay, so, um, so where are we? Uh, okay, um, the Tachtem Chalal, underneath that rock there was a, there was a gap, um, a, you know, um, a hollow. Mipnei Kever HaTom, to protect them from the, from the um, uh, corpse, or, you know, the, uh, the grave in the depths. I mean, there's maybe some buried, you know, buried tumma. Umeviyam Nashim, now, who would go on this rock? So Umeviyam Nashim Ubarot, they would bring pregnant women, the oldest Sham, and they give, have them give birth there. So the children that they would give birth to would never have had a chance to come in contact with a dead body or never have a chance to walk on the earth, the rest <laughs> of, you know, the rest of the planet where maybe there are dead people buried. They would be raised on this, you know, in this courtyard on top of this rock. Um, and Umegados um, B'neim Sham Lepara, and they'd raise their kids there for the Paraduma. That's like, like the Dalai Lama, right? Don't they do that? Like, you know, they identify even in, do they identify in utero? Like, no, who, not, in not in utero? Well, after was born? No, no, no. Okay, anyway, fine. So anyway, you would have to, like, the... <laughs> what? I know, he'd be, like, caught on their courtyard, right? Well, uh, right. So even even by Chana and um, and uh, Shmuel, right, she got a chance to first or wean him before she yeah. had to bring him to the base of Mikdash. Okay, here they'd be raised there on that rock. Uh, now, of course, Tosha says, I don't get it. You know, um, they, the, 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 the babies, when they were born, were, were tame because their mothers are, exactly, are tame. Gonna You're going to say that they're tame leda, so they make their <laughs> kids tame as well. So it says, okay, fine, you know, but what we're trying to do in particular is to ensure you, that, they're, they, that they're not tame mace. And that they never became tmei mace, meaning even if they came to tmei mace, you know, why do you have to go through this crazy thing? Do be purify them and then put them on the rock. Yeah. But no, so that's why we're going totally overboard. So yeah, the tumor they got from their mother's fine will purify, but in particular, we want to make sure they never became tmei mace. And the other thing we want to make sure that they never became was a tumor yotze megufo, a tumor that sort of comes from the body, which primarily for a man would focus, it could be zav, but it would primarily focus on balkeri. 
story. So we're going to see that they weren't going to use kids that were so young that they never yet would have had not, a chance just biologically, you know, to have had a seminal emission yet. Those are seen as the most severe tumas, the one that either is contact with dead or one that comes from one's own body. And those are the ones that they wanted not just to purify them from, but to make sure that they had never experienced themselves. What protects okay? them from the tumor, the, the overhang? The overhang. Because uh, it's prevent the tumor. It's an OL. Well, Any right. tumor underneath, boom, hits the overhang and stops. It doesn't go around the corner. No. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. So... Um, okay, the Yodo Shama, Gados Benayim Sham Le Parah, they would raise their kids there for the sake of doing the Paraduma. Um, Umivim Shvarim, then when it came time to actually draw the water for the Paraduma, so they would bring oxen of Al Gabeim de la Tot and have like these, um, uh, um, doors, you know, sort of on top, because the point is, if you have a door on top of your ox, right? I want to see this picture. You want to see the picture of my, of, of, of my ox with the door? So here's your ox. Um, okay, here's your ox, okay, and you have your door like this on top of your ox, okay, then you can sit on top of the ox, and then if there's any tumor as the ox is walking, because it's going to leave the rock now, it hits the underneath of the door, and it stops. So you're walking, you're tr going on top of an OL, and therefore platform. any tumor, a platform, and any tumor will stop, okay, so, um, all right, um, and they would have small children that would be raised there, sitting on them. And again, the purpose of small is that they were not yet of the age that they could be a Valkyrie. Um, the Chosos shall even be they him, and they would carry uh, containers out of stone. Why stone? Because stone can never be Makabel Tum'ah. Okay, so therefore they would use vessels that can never become Tamei. Higiu the Shiloach, they came to the Shiloach, the wellspring, um, and now they have to draw the water they're going to use for the paradum. It has to be Mayim Chayim El Keli, water, living water, meaning water from a stream um, drawn into a vessel. Yardu Latoch Mayim Umilum. So they had to get off the, you know, the uh, the oxen, at least for this. They they went off and they filled it up. And they went back and they sat back on the doors. Um, no, even for that one second, even for that, you know, tiny little space, getting off the ox and, get, and drawing the water, we're afraid in that one inch of land, there will be a buried body. So even there, we don't let them off the oxen. And we force them to lower down the body. It, you know, and then pull it back up. But we were forced them to not get off of the ox at all. Okay, the Tanya. So that's what they would do. So we really weren't talking about the Kohen who did the, uh, the right. Or it was just the people who would get the water. Just the people who would get the water. Right. All of this just to draw the water. The Kohen, of course, they couldn't make sure that he had never been a Balkari in his life or never been tummy in his life, but they would do that whole seven day process leading up and so on. And him, they would intentionally make at least some type of a tumor that day. In order that was what you know that was the cooler but right this is like this crazy thing not even for the people those that are burning the part just drawing the water There's something i don't understand about this though like the floor of your house so right there's an overhang right no Why because not? it's all dirt so if you've got a normal there's no ol right the whole problem is, is that if you're not right dirt is also made out of stone no 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 no, no. the problem is a gap if here you are you're on the ground right and there's a and there's a, a casket buried somewhere under. So the, pr the principle is tuma ritsutsa bokat v'olat. If there's no ohel, the tuma just goes straight up and it hits you. Okay. So the only way you're saved from that tuma is if there's a gap of a tefach which makes an ohel. So if you are here on your cow, let's say, right, and you're like this, then if the tuma tries to go up, it hits the underside of the. Of the of uh, 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 can't penetrate. It can't yeah. penetrate because there's an OL here because this is an OL created right if you're not on the ground but you're out you're you're on top of something that is a type of a roof. Okay. What's so similarly, right? If this is a rock, if there's a if there's let's say a cave here and this is all rock, so you know that there's nothing. So you know that there's uh, so you know nothing is buried there. And, right, and here's your and here's your tether. It'll try to go up, but it'll hit the bottom of the outcropping, and it'll stop. What's the relationship between the roof, the delet, yeah, and the uh, the halal? You need both. The delet is just to create a portable halal. When you are being when you are being raised here um, in the courtyard on this outcropping, 
right? What creates the roof? What creates the I, gap underneath? It's the fact that it's an so, outcropping. If you're going to walk around out of the outcropping, I, what if there's a buried casket over right. here? Nothing. There's no so, gap. So no, you create the gap by having a door. No, my point. So my so question is, what, what prevents the tumor from penetrating is actually the space. The space. It's well, the so space and the, then a, and then a roof over the space. Right, the For this to be considered a roof, there right. has to be a gap. I Correct. Understand. Yes. So the question is why the tasket itself can't be an ohel. The principle and the reason is an excellent question. The reason is is because the halacha is, is that the the uh, the casket becomes like the mace itself, and that's one of the major principles in ohelos. Whether that's halacha Moshe we see now, is it or abanan, but the the whole pa casket seat becomes an extension of the mace. Now, by the way, since we're talking about it, this Very becomes the big issue about. Kohanim flying, you know, taking certain flights because, uh, like, I think, what is it, either Kennedy or LaGuardia, one of them often, you know, the airports are at, like, the edge of the city, and that's also where there are a lot of cemeteries. And one of, I, I think one or both of these, like, pretty soon after it takes off, it's going right over a cemetery. Mm -hmm. So how do Kohanim, you know, now, if there are no Jews buried there, it's not a problem. Well, it's a debate, but as a general rule, we pask in that this tumor of tents, like, the idea, rather than just of tuck, but the tumor of being over them or being under the same roof, only applies to bodies of Jews. But we're talking about New York. There's a lot of bodies of Jews there. So what do you do? Well, the answer might be, well, how about the plane? Here you are. You're flying in your plane, right? Here's the dead body. Boom! I mean, it works as good as the door. Yeah. Okay. Two problems. One problem is, is that the plane is made out of metal <laughs> and made out of something that's makabel tuma. And kol davash makabel tuma eno chotzeitz bifnei hatuma. So if you have a wooden door or stone, because it can't become tame, it can serve as a block, as a roof. But the plane made out of metal cannot be a block, and then the problem is it should go through. The other issue, and Tosis raises this, is that there's actually a debate of something called Ohel Zaruk, a throne Ohel, which doesn't literally mean, I mean, it could mean that you think about like a Frisbee, right? <laughs> so what's the story if somebody's under a Frisbee flying overhead? That's literally that it's in movement. But really an Ohel Zaruk doesn't have to, you know, can, you know, can mean just something that is moving, even like moving slowly. So Tosos basically says, how does this thing work with the cows? Isn't this door an Ohel Zaruk? And he says, and that's not supposed to be a barrier. And he says, actually, it's a debate. This Mishnah obviously understands that an Ohel Zaruk Shmei Ohel can be a barrier. But there are opinions that it's not a good, uh, it's not a good, um, you know, sort of uh, 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 separation. It's not a good roof that would stop it. So the problem about planes flying over cemeteries is twofold. Number one is they're made out of metal and they shouldn't stop the Tumah. Number two is, is that it's an Ohel Zaruk. It's a moving Ohel and it's not sort of stationary. And that may or may not be a problem. Anyway, so this issue, you know, does come up. But here you see they're dealing with it by creating, first First of all, it's something that's not in the Kabil Tuma, it's a rock, it's a door, and there's a gap, and that creates the oil, it stops the Tuma from continuing up. Yes. What about the, what about Bodies that are being carried back to the burial tradition. Right. So that's a, that's a, you know that's even a bigger question. It's right there in the plane or whatever. I think I think that the co there's some way Kohani know which are those flights and they I not see. to go there. Oh, or they might do other things about you know um, you know. Uh, Again, there's ways you could do it. If you took that coffin and let's say you put it in a special, you know, let's say the, uh, you know, the, the space that you, this, what, what is it called? Not the, the, you know, whatever the hole that you put it in, you know, let's say you had built a, a like a wooden container to put the coffin in, right? And that wooden container, right, could serve, you know, specifically as a gap. So there's ways they try to accommodate the Kohanim, but the question is, you know, even in general, that, so they might specific, I assume they specifically do something like that because they know they're going to be carrying coffins, right? But as a, but that doesn't address the fact about a plane flying over a cemetery, you know. This concept yeah. of Oro Saru, is it applied to, for example, using umbrella on Shabbos? Um, somewhat. I mean, you're right. There is some similarity there about the degree. How much do we, again, apply these concepts they, oh, across categories, right? Which is what we're going to do here when we try to tie it into Sukkah. So let's get back to the Gemara. Betanya, we turn to the Brisa. Reb Yehuda Omer. Now, so far we don't know that Reb Yehuda necessarily agreed to any of this, but we're going to see in a Brisa that he did agree. Reb Yehuda Omer, lo hayim evim tlatot, elo shvarim. 
They didn't need the doors. The oxen themselves, we're going to say the gap between the bottom <laughs> of the stomach of the ox, actually later the Gemara is going to say the spine of the ox. But for now, let's just say the, bo the, the, you know, the, 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 the bottom of the ox to the floor, that itself is a no hell. And the ox itself would stop the Tumah from going Why through. The ox is tumah? What? Not Why a live animal. Is live animal is not Macabal Tumah. Okay. <laughs> what? Yeah, oh, the only live thing that's macabre to him is a human being. Okay, right. I mean, if you kill the ox, then it could be food, then it could be leather. But the way it is right now, it's not macabre to him. So he says, that's it. Okay. Vashvarim says the Gemara, oxen to Oel Shenu also be the Adam who? It's not made by human agency. Victani Rebun Omer Law Yimavim Vlasos El Shvarim, that they would not bring the oxen because they had the, the, the doors because they had the oxen. So you see, Rebbe Huda says that even something not made by human beings actually does serve as an OL. So pretty good question. Kokiasa Rev Dimi, I'm a Rebbe Eliezer. So when Rebbe Dimi came, he said, I'm a Rebbe Lazar. Moda Rebbe Yehuda Kemali Egrof. Rebbe Yehuda agrees that if it's so big that it's the fill of an Egrof. Now, an Egrof literally means a, a fist. A fist is not that much bigger than a tefach, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. what is it? It's a, is, <laughs> it right? pretty much is a tefach. So apparently, Malay Agrof refers to the fist of a very large individual, not Og Melech Abasham, but somewhere between him and us. And basically, the Gemara says it's like the size of a human head. Okay, it's got to be a pretty big fist. But anyway, the size of a human head. If it's that big, then he would concede that even if it's made naturally, then it also like a natural OL. Meaning, if you want it to be a formal OL based on the formal amounts of a tefach, you know, very specific, quantifiable amount, then it has to really be made. Its its intention of being made as an OL is part of what gives it its identity. Actually, it's a very powerful idea. You know, once it is so naturally serving as that, it doesn't matter what intention it was made with, right? If you go into a cave, right, even if it was all made naturally, you know, the roof of the cave is still a roof. But if you have something that's a little bit of a tefach off the ground, right, then it doesn't naturally, I mean, think about the idea of piling the, um, piling the, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the uh, yeah, the, the beans. So you happen to have a little, a, a little thing, a tefach wide underneath one of the krashim, that's not naturally a roof. To be defined as a roof, you would have to intentionally make it as such. But let's imagine that actually it was uh, like, you know, it was three feet high where the Krashim, and then somebody put some cross beams, and you could walk underneath it like a tunnel, like a covered tunnel. So there you could say, you know, that more by, you know, on its own is, I, you know, it's sort of naturally a type of a roof, even if it wasn't made intentionally as such. When it more functionally, in an, you know, becomes serving that purpose, then it could get its identity without it intentionally being made as such. So that's what Rabbi Yehuda says. If you want one tefach to be considered a roof, it has to be made by you and agency. It has to be made with that intent. If, however, it's very large, now I gave an example of three feet. I gave an example you could stand underneath it. But he would say very large, the size of a, of a head, then already, even without human agency, just purely naturally, it is also defined as a roof. So he would concede that point. And therefore, that's what's going on here with the oxen. Now, by the way, what is the size of the head? So Rashi initially says it means that the, you know, the area here, right, whatever, let's say my head is, I don't know, three tfachim, you know, three tfachim high. So it means the area of the, <coughs> of the, uh, of the ohel is would three tfachim, would cover that, you know, would be sort of the flat space of my head. But as we're going to see, continue, Rashi is going to also be talking about how high off it is from the ground. That's the example I gave you, right, about, mm -hmm. let's say you go into a cave, let's say you go into a, you know, under you like a covered space created by beams, right? So that also, that height is also Rashi is going to consider is part of the Malay Egro. So it's not exactly clear whether we're measuring the, the, the area of the roof or wearing the hollow underneath it. But the answer is, is that Rebbe Yehuda would concede those cases. Okay, Tanya Nami Hachi, we taught similarly in a Brisa. Rabbi Yehuda would agree that it, it, even though he disagrees with like the tunnels created by the, you know, by the, um, by the, uh, what are those things that are blind that dig underneath the ground? Um, no. The moles, even though he disagrees by like a mole tunnel, he would agree by like a you know a crack in the rock, meaning meaning like a cave essentially, a large hole, you know, naturally formed. So presumably the difference with that is, Tosos by the way says it's not just a Bryce, it's a Mishnah, is the size. If it's big enough, he'll admit that it is an ohel. Okay, so now the Gemara says one minute. Now, if he admits with that, once it's big enough, 
Farei Delek, why does he not like the door? Meaning you would have said you don't like the door because the door isn't made, you know, isn't so much naturally an ohel. Although, of course, the reason they put the door on the back of the ox was specifically to serve as an ohel. So the Gemara says, so then why doesn't he like the door? Farei Delek, the Yesh Bakama Egrofin, it has a couple, it has many Egrofin, either height off the ground or the size of the door. Uh, he said they didn't bring the door, they bring oxen. What does what don't you like about the door? And anyway, it's you know made intentionally to serve as an OL. It has all the good features. So what's the matter with it? So Amar Bai says Abai It means you don't have to bother. It doesn't mean there's a problem to drink the door. He means so you don't have to bother with the door. You got the ox. That's good enough. <coughs> okay, that's a pretty pretty good answer. Rav Amar Rav said no. Lo yimivim blasos. They specifically did not bring doors. Why not? Kovikar at all. Nay shedaito shotinok gasa alav. Because you don't want to have, have anybody to have a false sense of security. So he's going to be on a nice big door, right? A lot of space to stretch out. He's going to think that you know he can he, that that you know it's like sticking your head out the window, sticking your hand out the window. You feel so nice, safe, and secure. Shemi yotzi rosho echemei varav vitma. So he. He'll feel very, you know, very secure riding on that ox, and he'll lean over the edge of the door or stick his hand out the edge of the door, and then, you know, not chas v'shalom, he'll fall out, but chas v'shalom, he'll do it, and there'll be two more on, right, right over there. So we'd rather him go on the back of the ox and feel very trepidatious so that he does not, sort of, he's not adventurous in stretching out his arms or his head. We don't want him to feel so, too secure, and that's why we would, we do not want to use the door. Gato, Gasa, Allah means he won't be discerning? No, not, not discerning. He he'll feel be... very, he'll feel very much like in charge. He'll feel very much, uh, I'm it's trying to think. Better. So uh, it's not about how he thinks, it's about how he feels. Right. The title Gasa, Allah feels. Right, exactly. Right, right. It means... Right. Right. Exactly. Right. 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 Altitude. Right, but those Altitude. well under eight or up to eight or nine, they would right. have them. No, but those one is das here does not mean he is, he won't be intellectually. Cognitive. No, it means that they'll feel overly comfortable, overly in charge, right. and they'll do it and they'll go ahead and act in this way. Bekeber at home, and they'll stick up their arm and head, and they'll become tame with the with the uh, things that are buried underneath. Tiny kavasi de Rava, we taught like Rava. Rav Yehuda Omer, lo yim mivim de lasos kol ikarmi, nei shedato shatino kasalaf, shema yotzi roshog oecha mevar, vitma bekeber atom. A bright that says word for word what Rava said. It's quite fascinating sometimes when you have a bright tote in the Bavli that are word for word what an Amora said. Um, and he said that they would not do this, not, not because um, <laughs> you don't have to, they specifically would not, because it would lead to the tino, the, the, the young child being, um, uh, you know, unca not careful in a ways of, you know, that would lead to a Tumantara problem. Okay, now, we're going to continue looking at the Braita. Um, they would sit on the top of these uh, doors or oxen and have these uh, stone vessels. And then they would, this is the end of the Braita, which is similar to the first thing that we quoted, the Mishnah Para. And then when they came to the Shiloach, to the, to the wellspring, they would get off and fill it up. Okay, now, what we have done is we've established that while Reb Yudah says an OL is only something made intentionally as an OL, by human agency and with that intent, he will concede the point when it is very large, or not even very large, but somewhat large. So now, that's going to create a problem. We thought we had the perfect explanation of Reb Yehuda being lenient about being under the bed in the sukkah, because he doesn't consider that type of a thing an OL. But now we're saying that actually he concedes that many cases are an OL. So there's going to go our explanation. So let's take a look. Okay. Faremita, a bed, it has a couple of uh, sizes of these uh, fists. It's um, Batanan, and we taught in the Mishnah, that they would sleep under the bed. Now, why does that work? And once he would concede that such a thing would count as an OL. Um, there goes our great explanation. Sigma says no. Shani Mita Hovilagaba Asuya. No. A bed has another problem. A bed is specifically made to serve what's on top of it, not what's below it. So if you have a natural cave, then it can be an ohel naturally, without made with any intent. But if you have something that is made 
not for the purpose of being a roof, but for the purpose of actually doing the opposite of the roof, serving the space above rather than the space below, that, Rebbe Yehuda would say, does not count as an ohel. By the way, that's very relevant. We actually pay attention to that concern by Shabbos when it comes to, like, opening up a folding chair or opening up a table. Why isn't that a concern about making an ohel? So part of it might be because it's like, uh, you know, because it's, it's all on hinges, and that also removes a major part of the concern. But part of the explanation also is because it's not made to serve the space below. It's not functioning as an OL. It's functioning to serve the space above. So we're saying the same way Rebbe Yehuda has more demand to what defines an OHEL, you're right, this is not the problem of, you know, he, he would concede cases when it's big enough, but this is a problem that it's not made for the space below, it's made for the space above. Yes? There are beds, though, that are designed to have storage underneath the mattress. All right, we'll see something like that in a second. Okay. Okay. So the Gemara says... <coughs> Shvarim nami lagabana suyin. Oxen are also made to serve above. I mean, made by God, I guess. But they naturally, in terms of culturally, what you use the ox for, you use it for going, putting something on its back. So how is this any different? So Kiyasa Ravin, I'm a Rebbe Lezer. So again, Ravin came from Eretz Yisrael and said the teaching in the name of Rebbe Lezer, like he did before. Shani Shvarim, hol umigini malharoyim bechamet nechamet gushamim nechamet No, what shepherds will do is they'll go underneath the, you know, underneath the ox. When it's too hot, they'll get some shade. When it's raining, they'll protect themselves from the rain. So I guess it doesn't mean God made it for a different purpose, but I guess it means that culturally, if you ask, how is it functioning within our culture? It doesn't only function for the space for, for above; it also functions for below, and therefore it works. But a bed only functions for above. When it says one minute, uh, if that's true, that you can use like an occasional use to define its identity, mita hanami. How about a bed? You put your shoes and your sandals under the bed, and therefore it should protect. You know, it's done also as a storage space, as Charlie will say. Okay, so why isn't that the same? And it should be considered an OL. El Amarava, so we can't say that. We have to go by the primary use. Okay, and that's going to, and therefore, back to the idea, we're not going to look at a secondary use, the primary use. And the bed doesn't count because it serves the space above. So how about the ox? Why is the ox different? So El Amarava, Shani Shvarim, Because we're not looking at the underside of the belly of the ox, which would have been the most obvious to focus on. We're actually looking at the rib cage of the ox. Okay, the backbone and the rib cage, that's the OL. And that actually serves the space below, because what does the rib cage serve for? To protect the in inner organs. Okay, Shenemar, <laughs> as the pasuk says, or ubasar talim bisheni ubaatmot v'gidin tisochecheni. Look at that, the word of schach. Right, God uh, dresses me with flesh and bones, and with and with bones and uh, sinews. He, um, uh, I'm sorry, not flesh and bones, flesh and uh, skin, and with bones and sinews, he shades over me. The word schach. So you see, basically, the rib cage of the ox is what is the OL that's protecting the inner organs as opposed to the bed. The bed <coughs> primarily serves what is above, not what is below. So the and that's, of an ox is an upside down OL? Not upside down. <laughs> what do you mean upside down? It's not upside down. It's right side up. It's right side up. You've got your ox's rib cage here, right? Here's your ox. And it's got its, it's, got its rib cage, right? That's its rib cage. And it's rib cage, and here are all the inner organs in the rib cage. So the rib cage here, right, is pr is protecting the inner organs, and therefore this is the ohel to the space ever space below, including if there is a dead body below, right, because of the top of the rib cage. You got it? Uh, yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. You're saying that the anatomy of an animal is essentially a natural ohel. Exactly. Okay, so now the Gemara says, and it's helpful that the animal walks on all fours, because for us, our rib cage isn't an OL, because it's protecting in the horizontal plane. But that's, I mean, or in the vertical plane, but that's I mean, protecting in the horizontal. Yeah, there you go. So what would you be say about the, what would you say about, about an ape? I don't know, but okay. But <laughs> anyway, so, all right. So now the Gemara says like this, okay. Uh, so that's our answer. The bed is not an ohel because we know Reb Yehuda has more requirements for an ohel of intentionality. And even though sometimes, even without intention, he'll concede, here it is made, not made for the space below it.
The Eba Yisim, and if you want, we could drop this whole discussion of Tuma Vitara, drop the whole comparison, it has nothing to do with that Reb Yehuda by, Ohel, by Oelos. Reb Yehuda Latame, Reb Yehuda goes according to his other reasoning, not the reasoning in Oelos. The Amar Sukkah Deris Keva Be'inan, remember that Reb Yehuda said that a Sukkah is a permanent uh, dwelling, because Reb Yehuda said you can have a Sukkah more than 20 Amos high, that very first Mishnah. And what Abaye said, if you remember, Abaye listed a number of Tanaim that all reflected an understanding of a sukkah being a more permanent dwelling. So since that is Rabbi Yehuda's reasoning, and the bed is a very temporary type of a roof. The sukkah, keva, and the sukkah for him is definition, definitionally a permanent roof. And a temporary roof does not come and negate the permanent roof. If you ask, what are you under? What roof are you under? You wouldn't say, I'm under the roof of the bed. You'd say you're under the roof of the sukkah. It's not like it's a separate type of a, you know, of a, of a roof, right? A separate type of a serious structure. It's temporary. So if both things were temporary, you'd focus on the more proximate one to you. But if one's temporary and one's permanent, the temporary one really does not have any significance. And that's what he's based on. Let me just finish this. He says, the ha Rebbe Shimon, not the Amanami sukkah dirus kevabina, so the says, ah, but if you remember our discussion earlier, Reb Shimon, we also identified as somebody who had a concept of a permanent, um, of a sukkah being a permanent dwelling. Reb Shimon said a sukkah doesn't need two walls and a bit. He said it needs three walls and a bit, right? He demanded an extra wall. So Reb Shimon holds that it is more of a permanent. So how come he's arguing with Reb Yehuda? So the Asi Ola Rai Mavato Lo Keva, and he says if you're under the bed, it's a problem that the temporary tent does negate the more permanent tent. So they both hold that a sukkah is a permanent is a permanent dwelling. Why are they debating about the bed? So the Gemara says yes, Bahad Kabligi. That's exactly what they debate. They agree to the identity of the sukkah. The question is, what does it do to be in a more permanent structure while also in a, a more temporary structure while also in a more permanent? Marsavar Asiola Rai Mavatol Ol Keva. Rabbi Shimon says, I don't care that the bed is temporary and the oil is permanent or, you know, halachically permanent. That you're still under the bed and you're not under the schach, and that negates the significance of being under the schach. Umar Savar and Rabbi Yudha says, Lo Asiola Rai Mavatol Ol Keva. No, relative to the schach, this is insignificant, and you're not considered to be under the bed. You're primarily considered to be under the schach, so they both agree that halachically the sukkah is per seen as permanent, the bed is temporary, and they're debating what is the status of being under a temporary tent while also under a more, a high, you know, a more distant permanent roofing. And is it considered that you're still under the permanent roofing or not? That is exactly the debate. Yeah, you had a question. Yes. I don't know if you discussed this before, but the whole concept of going outside your home into a temporary dwelling, even though maybe permanent with the walls, right. I thought the schach to represent the impermanence. Yes, yeah, so that is true. And here they're defining it more like like permanent, right. So that's a very good point. Meaning, the whole question is sukkah no'el arai or no'el keva. It's like this very interesting tightrope it's walking, right? On the one hand, it's supposed to be a substitute for your house. And what makes it distinct from your house is that your house is permanent and this is temporary. But to really consider it a substitute for the house, it has to be house-like and it has to have permanent qualities. So you're absolutely correct that that's, you know, it's that sort of very contradictory zone, which, um, you know, which is sort of, do you define it therefore as permanent or not? But even those that say that an ohel, that a sukkah is seen as permanent, do not go to the extreme. They would still admit that you have to maintain, like, the impermanence to some degree of the schach. Like, to, the first thing Tozel's point out at the beginning of the Masechet is, it would have to, like, let rain through. It would have to be, an, it would still have to be an element of impermanence in the schach that makes it distinct from your home. That's correct. But you're right, you could still say, okay, it has to be weaker than my roof, it has to let rain through, but halachically I'm still identifying it as keva. So you do make an excellent point that we're calling the schach keva, and we're still going to demand elements of impermanence to make it distinct from your roof at home. That's absolutely correct. Yes. I'd like to go back for a moment to the ox. Are we saying that that ox, when it's standing there, is chotzeit smitnei atuma? Yes. And if it were to remain standing but dead, yeah. it would then become a source of tumor. Um, well, it's a source of tumor once it's dead because it's nevela. Okay, saying, yes. It's a standing yes. nevela, yes. even though it's structurally an ohel. Yes. It's no, but something that is, the but yeah, something that's makabel tumor, or if it's nevela, actually is tamei, is not chotzei tzbifnei ha tumor. Right. So. Right. It would be different once it's dead. All right. Now, I'm Reb Shimon. So now, Reb Shimon's response to Reb Yehuda is. 
You said the Zakanim didn't respond. Quite the opposite. The Zakanim were with Rebbe Gamliel, and he made the point of saying, look, Tevi is exempt from a sukkah, and that's why he's under the bed. So you see, being under a bed, you're not Yotze. So Tanya, we told the Bryce, I'm Rebbe Shimon, Misichatosha Rebbe Gamliel, from like the, the uh, you know, casual conversation of Rebbe Gamliel, Laman Nushnei Dvarim, we can infer two halachas. Laman Nushnei Dvarim, Ketrimin HaSukkah, Slaves are exempt, which isn't a big chiddush, but okay. Um, and we also learned that sleeping in a sukkah, you didn't fulfill your uh, in a bed under under a bed in a sukkah, you didn't fulfill your obligation. Okay, so that's the bright. Why does it say from his casual conversation? Why don't you say from his words we infer? What's the idea of underscoring that it was casual conversation? So the Gemara says, No, he's telling you another point along the way. So this Ravacha Bar Ada say, or some say it's a tradition from Rav. How do you know even the casual conversation? Some gear says have sichas chulin, right? Oh. Even the non-Torah conversation of tamidei chachamim tzricha limud, or some have tzricha talmud. You need to like pay attention to it, and you know, and sort of analyze what they're saying and learn out from what they're saying. There's depth to even their casual comments. Shenemar the aleu lo yibo. Even the, the the leaves don't wither, not just the fruit, not just the Torah. Even the stuff that's around the Torah, even this casual conversation, it's so infused with Torah that you can even infer something from that, which is quite interesting because, you know, this wasn't totally casual conversation. He was sort of making a halachic point, uh, you know, but Rashi says, well, it wasn't his intent to teach halacha. His intent was to say, ah, oh, look what a good from slave I've got. You see that? He knows halacha. He wasn't trying to teach halacha. Okay. But anyway, it's even more interesting, you know, it's true, like sometimes you learn a lot about a person and their midot and their way of thinking and so on by even listening carefully to their casual conversation, not just their prepared conversation. And that's a very important principle that teaches you. Somebody who really is a scholar and you have a lot to learn from who they are and how they are, you know, you pay attention even to the way they speak in a casual context. What did... Um, Okay, so let's take um, so let's take a look. We have uh, yeah. Let's start the next Mishnah. Now, this next Mishnah is very important because it gets to this whole issue of um, can you have your schach rest on something that's makabel tuma, oh, right? Do people know the whole idea? Can you have your schach rest on the metal frame, rest on the canvas, or do you have to put a piece of wood between the schach and the metal frame? So that's based on this Mishnah. Let's take a look. Hasomich sukato mitak sheira. If you support your sukkah by the bed frame, it's kosher. So somehow you have a bed frames around your schach, or maybe you actually, according to the Yerushalmi, the way Tosis discusses, you have a bed in your sukkah, but you're not sleeping under the bed, you're sleeping on the bed, but like you have a, you, you made canopy over the legs of the bed, like the legs of the bed, like a four-poster bed, and you use those legs to put schach on top of. Okay, so your sukkah is supported by a bed in one way or another, which is itself makabal tuma. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, Im lamod I'm sorry, Kshera, it's kosher. <laughs> Rabbi Yehuda Omer, lamod If it can't stand by itself, for you to remove the bed, the schach would fall down, psula, it's invalid. So the whole problem here, anyway, only begins in Rabbi Yehuda. So the first thing we have to ask is, how do we rule? And if Michael's here, he'd be asking that right away. Do we rule like the Chachamim or we rule like Rabbi Yudah? If you rule like the Chachamim, this is a complete non-issue. Any concern here that the Schach is supported by the bed is a Rabbi Yehuda concern. Okay, so the first issue is, do we rule Chachamim or rule Rabbi Yudah? Even if we rule Rabbi Yehuda, what's his problem? For us, we've translated that problem as something called Mamid Bedavar HaMakabal Tuma, supporting the Schach with something that is Tameh. But let's see what the Gemara says. The Gemara is not so clear that's his issue. So the Gemara says like this, my time at Rabbi Yudah. What's the reason of Rabbi Yudah? It's a debate. Because it's a very temporary type of a schach. You'll remove your bed, which is it's not made to be there as a wall, and the schach will fall down. So why does he say the schach has to be able to be support itself without the bed? Because otherwise, the whole schach is in a highly temporary, right? not only a diras arai, it's a really highly temporary, it's, it's highly impermanent. You'll take your bed away, and the schach will fall down. That's the problem. The chadam, no, Specifically, it's because it's not its impermanence, it's the fact that the bed is makabal tumah. And the same way the schach can't be makabal tumah, the thing that directly supports it cannot as well. The walls can be, but not the stuff that directly supports the schach. Okay? And that has to not be makabal tumah. My benayu, what's an example between them? He goes, 
exactly our case is. You made a metal frame sukkah, right? So, if the problem is impermanence, it's a nice metal frame. But if the problem is the schach is directly being supported, not by a something that can become tamei, you're doing that. Amar baye, lo shanu ela samach, aval sichei chagabe mita kshera. So it, it's only when the schach is supported by the bed. But if it's done on top of the bed, which means in a way in which, this seems by context what's meant, a way in which the bed is not actually supporting the schach, then it would be totally fine. My time, what's the reason? It's permanent because you could remove the bed and the schach will still stand. You're not supporting it by the bed. You're, the bed is a wall, but you're not supporting it. So this becomes the big issue. Do we rule like Reb Yehuda? And if we do rule like Reb Yehuda, which reason of Reb Yehuda? To say there's a problem of Mamid requires two chumras. To say we rule like Reb Yehuda and, there is, and that the reason is mam is Mamid B'davar Mechabal Tuma. Then the question becomes, what about Mamid the Mamid? Right? What about two degrees removed? Can you have like the metal frame? If you couldn't have Mamid the Mamid, then, you know, then, you know, everything would have to be of an Ainu Mechabal Tuma because everything is a, a certain degree removed from the, from, from the Schach. So that's the position of the Chazanish. The Chazanish says, it's not only do you it can't have something that's mam, that's Mechabal Tuma that directly supports it, it can't even indirectly support it. So you know what he says you can't have? Even if you have a whole wooden frame, you can't have, according to those that are nails, because the nails are keeping the frame together, and that is indirectly. So like there's like these chazan ish sukkahs, which are made with like wood pegs instead of nails. Somebody once said it's like a coffin, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that is something taking an extreme of this position about mommy bedavar makabel Okay, there we go. Park two guys downstairs. Yes.